No, we are recording. Okay, so here we go. All right. Let's open up with an example here. Suppose a teacher is studying the relationship between the number of hours a student studies every week and the student's grade on a test. The collected data is shown in the table. So um, it appears that we have six different students that were selected. Uh, the X data represents the number of hours that are studied. And the Y coordinate represents the percent uh, that they, they've earned on the exam. Now, you can see why they chose X and Y to be what they are, uh, because the X variable we normally call the independent variable. Um, and we uh, normally call the, uh, the Y variable the dependent variable, okay? in the sense that y depends upon x. And so it seems natural to think that your exam grade would depend upon the number of hours that you spent uh, preparing for the exam as opposed to the other way around. Sometimes the independent variable is called the explanatory variable because it, in a sense, explains uh, what happens to your uh, dependent variable. And the dependent variable is sometimes referred to as a response variable in the sense that it responds in such a way uh, dependent upon what happens with the explanatory variable or the independent variable. Nonetheless, we have six ordered pairs here. All right, and notice the Y values are actually percents, okay? Now, a scatter plot is a nice way to uh, ascertain any sort of relationship that exists between uh, paired uh, data um, and um, because we have ordered pairs, uh, each with an X coordinate and a Y coordinate, we can plot them in the X, Y plane. And after we plot all the points that we collect, the data points we collect, the ordered pairs we collect, that's called a scatter plot. Normally, our scatter plots just occupy the first quadrant. Um, once in a while, they occupy some other quadrants, but normally it's just the first quadrant. And that definitely would be the, uh, the case here, as both test scores and the number of hours spent studying for an exam are both positive. I mean, they're not negative. There's no such thing as a negative test score, and there's no such thing as a negative number of hours of studying for an exam. Okay. All right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, just by looking at the scatter plot, you can ascertain uh, in a qualitative sense what type of relationship or um, strength of correlation, we say, exists between X and Y. If you look at this first plot here um, in the top left, uh, you can see that the points are oriented in such a way so that uh, they uh, begin in the lower left uh, portion of this first quadrant, and they terminate in the upper right corner of this first quadrant. Um, and notice these points are very close to each other. All right, They're not really scattered far away from each other. Uh, we would say that such a scatter plot signature would indicate that we have a very strong positive uh, linear relationship or a very strong direct or positive correlation between X and Y. Um, if your scatter plot looks like the one to the right where the points uh, basically slant from uh, upper left corner to lower right corner in the first quadrant, then we would say that we have a very strong um, negative um, or inverse correlation um, between X and Y. And since these points are, you know, really hugging close together and uh, kind of like hug a theoretical line you could put through those points, we would say that we have a strong negative or inverse variation or relationship or correlation between X and Y. And that'd be a linear correlation, right? 
If, on the other hand, if you collect an ordered pair data set and uh, scatter plot turned out to be uh, like the one in the lower left on this slide here, then it really doesn't look like you'd want to fit a line to this data, but rather you might want to fit maybe a parabola to this data. Um, because of that, it looks like we have a strong uh, quadratic correlation between X and Y. If you collect the data and the scatter plot look like this one over here, uh, essentially, it doesn't look like you have any discernible relation between X and Y. It just looks like a random scatter uh, plotting of points. And for that reason, we would say that uh, there's a very poor, if any, relationship uh, between X and Y here. So we would say the correlation between X and Y is uh, minimal um, or does not even exist for such a data set as this. Right. So just by looking at your scatter plot, uh, it can not only give you, like I said, a um, non-numeric feel for the strength of relationship that exists between X and Y, but it also can tell you what type of relationship exists between X and Y, between his, um, um, whether it's a linear relationship or maybe some sort of a non-linear relationship. Uh, and that can also help steer you in the right direction if you want to try to fit the data points with some sort of a line or a curve um, or some sort of a function. And that's called regression analysis, right? So scatter plots are really valuable in that sense. Any questions about this slide here? All right, suppose we have this data set here uh, comparing the heights and feet of six buildings to the number of stories each building has. So obviously it seems like the more stories that a building has, uh, the higher it's gonna be. Okay, generally speaking, that seems about right. Well, um, we can build a scatter plot and plot these uh, six ordered pairs uh, what would be logical to designate as being our explanatory versus response variable here? In other words, what would probably be our independent variable? What would probably be our dependent variable? Um, well, notice the author uh, designated the height of the building as being the independent variable and the number of stories as being the dependent variable. You can tell just by looking at how the axes are labeled here, right? Notice uh, the horizontal axis, they have tick marks spaced uh, 100 units apart, starting at uh, 500. The vertical axis, the tick marks are spaced uh, 10 units apart, starting at 30. You can see that as X increases, as the X coordinates increase for these points, the Y coordinate also tends to increase. Um, that is an indication that we have a rather strong direct uh, or positive correlation between X and Y. Now, these lines are not hugging together uh, along a theoretical line as tightly as, uh, you know, that other scatter plot we've seen a couple slides ago. But nonetheless, um, there appears to be some sort of a linear relationship uh, between X and Y. And it seems like maybe you'd want to maybe put a line to the data like right through here to try to minimize uh, what's called the amount of error that exists between the actual Y values and the predicted Y values uh, of this line here. All right. So... It looks like the data is fairly well positively correlated and does exhibit a linear relationship. All right. <clears throat> All right. Here's another data set uh, table that shows a relationship between a number of absences of seven students and their final grade in the course. And 
if you've taught or ever uh, tried to educate uh, students, um, you'll realize that there it tends to be a relationship between their final grade in the course and the number of absences. Usually that's a, um, a very strong linear inverse correlation between those two things there. The, number, the greater the number of absences, the lower in general the final grade is. Right? So they're calling the number of absences the independent or the explanatory variable and the dependent or response variable is the uh, the final grade, all right? And you can see that as the number of absences increase, as the x values increase, the y coordinate values decrease, meaning the final grade tends to decrease. You can see that if you were to put a line through this data, it would fit the data points rather well. Um, next week, we'll show you how to build that line, to find that line that minimizes something called the sum of squared errors. It's called the least squares regression line. But today, we're just going to concentrate on correlation uh, between X and Y data. But it does look like we have a very strong linear inverse or negative correlation between number of absences versus final grade. This point here, um, Almost looks like an outlier of some sort, doesn't it? Doesn't really look like it fits with all the other ones in here. Uh, so that's kind of a, a strange observation that might need further investigating. All right. Any questions so far? Wind speeds. Table below shows the average and maximum wind speeds miles per hour for seven randomly selected areas. Uh, the average wind speed versus the maximum wind speed. Uh, I'm assuming, yeah, it's for the same area here. So they, they measured the average wind speed for a particular ge geographical location and measured the maximum wind speed for that same geographical location. So they kept this data paired here together. The average wind speed has been designated as the X variable and the maximum wind speed is the Y variable. So generally speaking, if your average wind speed is high, um, there's usually high peaks in that uh, average wind speed. And so it seems like the maximum wind speed would tend to be a little bit higher uh, in that case, as opposed to a low average wind speed situation. Well, after plotting these uh, data points here, and there looks like there's seven observations, it really does not look like a very strong linear relationship of any type whatsoever. Um, you know, it looks like these are linear, uh, you know, negatively uh, correlated in a linear sense, but then these are like positively correlated in a linear sense. So, uh, this does not look like a very good relationship um, between average wind speeds and maximum wind speeds. So therefore, we would expect the correlation coefficient to be very small here for such a bivariate or ordered pair data set. Not a very good relationship here. All right. Instead of being qualitative like this and just looking at the scatter plot and saying yay or nay as far as the relationship is concerned, let's become a little bit more mathematically precise. Correlation coefficient is a numerical measure of the strength of the linear relationship that exists between X and Y. Okay, the population co co correlation coefficient rho, that's not a P, that's a, a looks like a P, but it comes from the Greek alphabet. Uh, its name is Rho, R-H-O. Rho represents uh, symbolically the population correlation coefficient. Uh, and of course, this is the correlation coefficient for all 
uh, ordered paired data within a population, which could number in uh, hundreds of thousands or millions. The linear correlation coefficient measures the strength and direction of a linear uh, relationship that exists between X and Y. Um, and it is denoted as lowercase r, okay? Lowercase r. The linear correlation coefficient is often referred to as the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient. Um, r, ladies and gentlemen, this correlation coefficient ranges between one and negative one. So it's always a decimal between one and negative one. So you're never going to compute the correlation coefficient R for an ordered pair data set and have it be like two or negative three or anything. That's not going to happen. And the way it works is this. The closer R is to positive one, the stronger the positive linear relationship exists between X and Y. The closer R is to negative one, the stronger the negative or inverse linear relationship exists between X and Y. The closer R is to zero, the stronger case you have for saying there is no relationship, no linear relationship between X and Y. Okay, so this gives us a, a more precise uh, numerical assessment as to the correlation that exists between our um, ordered pair data. It's called the Pearson correlation coefficient R. Well, how do we compute R? Well, there is a formula. We'll see it in a moment. Notice for this scatter plot here in A, um, it looks like there is a fairly strong linear positive correlation between X and Y. But these points are kind of scattered far away, a little bit far away from a line that you'd put right through the middle of these data points to, on average, appease all the data points. Uh, because these points do not lie exactly on a line, um, we would say that, yes, there is a significant positive correlation between X and Y, but we would not expect R to be exactly one. As it turns out, the correlation coefficient for this data set R was 0 0.50. Notice it's positive, indicating that you have a positive linear correlation between X and Y. Okay, so it lies between zero and one. So it's a fairly strong positive linear correlation. This one here, the data points, uh, not only exhibit a positive correlation, uh, but uh, tend to hug a line very, much more closely than an A. And because of that, we would suspect that we have an even stronger linear positive correlation between X and Y. And you can clearly see that that is the case by the correlation coefficient R, which is about 0.90. That's very close to positive one. Now, these points actually lie on a line. And this line would have a positive slope. That's called a rising line. And therefore, because they lie on a rising line, exactly on a rising line, we would say that we have a perfect linear positive correlation between X and Y. And the correlation coefficient of such a data set as this would be exactly positive one. This data set here tends to be falling from upper left to lower right. So it appears to be some sort of a negative or inverse uh, variation that exists between X and Y. But these data points are far away from each other. They're kind of far away from a line if you were to put a line in here. In general, most data points do not hug this line well. Therefore, we would suspect the correlation coefficient R would be negative to reflect the fact that we do have, in an overall sense, a negative or inverse linear correlation but we would not suspect it to be exactly negative one. As it turns out, it's negative 0.5. Again, a scatter plot represents an inverse or uh, negative relationship or correlation between X and Y. And these points tend to hug a line a little closer than they do in D here. As a result, we would suspect R to be even closer to negative one, negative 0.9. These points here lie exactly on a line, they're all collinear points. And this line is a falling line, it has a negative slope. And so therefore we would say the correlation coefficient here would be exactly negative one. That is the strongest negative or inverse correlation you could have between X and Y if R is equal to negative one. 
All right, any questions about the scatter plots versus or corresponding correlation coefficient values here? Okay. Now, these are just some properties of the linear correlation coefficient. Um, the coefficient is unitless, meaning it's just a number. It doesn't have any units attached to it, like miles per hour or feet or seconds or grams or kilograms. It's a unitless number. The value of R always lies between negative one and one, um, inclusive. The values of X and Y are interchange. If the values of X and Y are interchanged, the value of R will not change. That's interesting. So if you interchange what you call the dependent versus independent variable, Ladies and gentlemen, that's not going to change the value of the correlation coefficient. It remains the same. That's interesting to note. If the values of X and Y are converted to different units, the value of R will also not change. In other words, if you had X and Y both of the units like feet and you wanted to convert them into like inches, well, guess what? The correlation coefficient still will not change. And you stop and think, why would it change? Because you're doing the same thing to X and Y to convert from its present units to some new units. So because you're doing the same thing to every data point, it seems like it would still be proportionally the same. The value of R is sensitive to outliers and can change dramatically in their presence. So if your data set is plagued with outliers, you may want to consider removing some of those extreme outliers from your data set in order to get a more accurate assessment as to the correlation that uh, in, in essence exists. As R gets closer to negative one, the scatter plot gets closer to a decreasing line. As R gets closer to positive one, the scatter plot gets closer and closer to an increasing line. For the correlation coefficient to be valid, three things must be true. The sample must be random. The data pairs fall approximately on a straight line measured at the interval or ratio level. Um, and remember, those were the two highest uh, uh, means of numerical measurement. We had nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. Okay. Uh, the variables should have a bivariate normal uh, distribution. Uh, this means that if X is fixed and Y, if X is fixed, Y should be normally distributed. If Y is fixed, then X should be normally distributed. Um, so in other words, the coordinates of these ordered pairs uh, should be normally distributed if you were to fix the other coordinate, hold it constant. Here it is, ladies and gentlemen, this is the formula to compute the Pearson correlation, linear correlation coefficient. And it is a very intimidating formula. Um, notice in our numerator, we have uh, a lot of summations appearing. And in our denominator, underneath this entire square root, yes, this whole quantity is underneath the positive square root. So this square root extends all the way over. And this is all underneath it. The product of two bracketed quantities. Here's the first bracketed quantity being multiplied by this bracketed quantity. Notice in order to compute the correlation coefficient R, we're going to have to know the sums, not only of our X and Y data, but also of the product of our X and Y data. This is called a mixed sum right there. I also want to point something out very important. Are these saying the same thing? Are these equivalent to each other? Do you think those are equal to each other? No. No, they are not. So don't fall into a little common trap and thinking that they're the same. They're totally different. They're not equal. This is saying, first, we square all the X observations, and then we add them up. This is saying something entirely different. This is saying, first, we just add up all of our X uh, observations, the X data, and then we just square that sum. So summing up the squares is not equal to squaring the sum. 
So be careful of that. <clears throat> now the good news, ladies and gentlemen, is that we do have on our TI-84, uh, we do have the correlation coefficient R that's computed for us automatically when we enter in an ordered pair data set into our list. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm still going to have ourselves dragged through the mud a little bit in uh, computing this correlation coefficient R manually. Uh, by doing that, that only strengthens your ability to deal with complicated computations um, and can only enhance your future computational uh, um, skills that you will you will need. Okay, so um, now, you know, when you go to do these things on Alex, you know, you're welcome to use a calculator. But uh, during this session, I'm going to show ourselves how to, you know, crank this out manually. And then I'll also show you on the calculator. All right, let's get back to that building problem. Remember where we had the heights versus the what? The uh, number of stories of the buildings. Um, so the X data is the height of the building in feet. The Y data is the number of stories uh, that exist in a building. Um, and so to compute the linear correlation coefficient, we're going to have to, you know, make a table to help us with our intermediate calculations that are necessary uh, before we can actually crank out what R is here. Okay. So notice we're going to have an X times Y column where we just multiply our height value by the corresponding story value. We're going to have an X squared column where we square the X data and a Y squared column where we square the Y data. Notice at the bottom, we total up all these... Uh, these columns here. So this would be the sum of the X values. This is the sum of the Y values. This is the sum of the X times Y values. This is the sum of the squared X values. And this is the sum of the squared Y values. All right. And obviously, we need to know all these values in order to put these into the formula and having any hopes of computing R, the correlation coefficient, between the height of the building and the number of stories it possesses. So you see how this table helps us out, cranking out these needed values here and these needed statistics. All right. <clears throat> And so now what they do is they substitute into this formula everything that we know. In other words, how many ordered pairs do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six ordered pairs. So lowercase n is going to be six. The sum of the x times y data is going to be 283,901 minus the sum of the x data which is 4,543 times the sum of the Y data, 351, all divided by the positive square root of six times the sum of the X squared values, which is 370, well, that's 3,700,051, minus the square of the X values. Notice it's not the sum of the X squared values, it's the square of the X, the sum of the X values which is the square of 4,543. That's all in one bracket, times six times the sum of the y squared values, which is 220, what is that? 220,000, uh, 22,003, right? 22,003, is that correct? Minus the, the square of the sum of the y values, which is the square of 351. Get on your calculator, ladies and gentlemen, see if you can dial this up on your machine. Now, when you type all this in on your calculator, uh, you're gonna have to remember the order of operations or else you're not gonna get the correct result. So, um, what I'm saying here 
is that when you dial this up here, you need to put parentheses around your entire numerator. Open parenthesis six times 283,901 minus 4,543 times 351, closed parenthesis, divided by, now the square root. Second X squared button brings up the square root function. Open parenthesis, instead of an open bracket, we have six times 3,700,000 51 uh, minus 4543 squared. Notice your calculator is going to deal with the exponent first, then the multiplication, then the subtraction. That's the quantity in the first set of brackets. Closed bracket times open bracket. Now we got the six times the uh, 22,003 minus the 351 squared. Close bracket. Kick the cursor out from underneath the square root. There it is. Hit enter, and you should crank out the correlation coefficient, which is about 0 0.927. Did we all get that? Are we good on this? Now, if you have to make some change to that long formula, you could hit your second button followed by your entry button to bring back that formula, and then you can move your cursor anywhere to make any changes that are necessary instead of typing the whole darn thing back in. Anybody see I entered that in there? Make sure you got to enclose your entire numerator side parentheses or else you're not going to get the correct result. You'll get what's called a logical error. Do we all get that? 0.927, anybody that did not get that? All right, so that yes. is the, that's the correlation coefficient for this ordered pair data set here. So what do you think? Positive 0.927. Is this a strong, is it, what kind of a relationship is this? Positive or negative linear relationship? Is it a direct or indirect linear relationship? Since the correlation coefficient R is positive, what do we say? Do we have a direct or indirect variation or correlation between X and Y? Positive? Yeah, it's positive. Uh, how how strong of a positive linear correlation do we have? Is it a strong correlation or fairly strong or weak or almost non-existent? What, what's going on here? Strong? Yeah. R is pretty close to positive one. And so therefore, it looks like it's a very, you know, rather very strong. You know, really there's a strong positive linear correlation between the number of stories that a building has and the height of the building. All right. Now, another way we could have uh, computed that using our calculator for checking purposes is uh, first we'd have to go back to the ordered pair data set. Let's bring our calculator up and I'll show you how we could Crank this out using our uh, our calculator. All right. So we're going to go to uh, clear your screen, go to stat, edit. In list one, we'll type the heights of the building. That'll be our X data.
And in list two, we're going to type in the number of stories that the building has. All right. So we enter our bivariate data set into list one and two, respectively. All right. Now we're going to get out of this by hitting second mode to quit. And uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, this is a one-time thing that we have to do. Hit your mode button. The top of your keyboard, you have a mode button. And we need to go down and uh, turn what is called a stack diagnostics. We've got to turn this feature on. Presently, my stat diagnostic feature is turned off. I'm going to go over here and toggle it on. So hit enter and turn it on. Uh, this feature is important to have on. If you don't have it on, then uh, your calculator is not going to compute R, your uh, linear correlation coefficient R will not be computed. Okay. All right. Second mode to quit. Why don't you turn that on? I will show you now how we can build a scatter plot for this ordered pair data. We need to go into our stat plot mode. So that would be your second key followed by your Y equal key. Notice we have three stat plots at our disposal. All of my plots are turned off. Um, if yours are not, please do go down to number four and turn them all off. Let's now dive into stat plot number one. I'm going to toggle it on. And then, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to go down and select uh, scatter plot, the first icon here. Notice my X data is list one, my Y data is in list two. Uh, what kind of mark you use and color you use is purely aesthetic. aesthetic. It doesn't uh, affect the computation one bit. All right, let's get out of this now, second mode. So we've configured plot one to build a scatter plot from our ordered pair data put into list one, list two. All right, we're ready. Hit zoom. Go down and select the zoom stat feature. Hit enter, and you should see your scatter plot. Now, one data point here is just not conforming. What data point does that appear to be? It looks like it's it just doesn't belong or it's messing around with our linear relationship big time. It's this one in the upper left uh, corner of our first quadrant. Hit the trace button and let's see what value that is. It's not that one. It's 8776. Wait a minute here. Well, that's why it's it's messing around with things because that should not even be there because I did not type in my ordered pair correctly. It should be 887, comma 76. I only typed in 87. No problem. Just go back to stat, edit. Go down to that bogus entry of 87 and overtype it with 887. No problem. Okay, there we go. Now we'll build that scatter plot again. Zoom, zoom stat, and there we go. That looks a lot better. You hit your trace button, ladies and gentlemen. You can walk along these points here by hitting your left uh, or down arrow key or one of your arrow keys, right arrow key. You can move from data point to data point and see what ordered pair it is, okay. All righty, so that's your scatter plot there. Now, how are we gonna bring up our correlation coefficient R? Uh, well, uh, we can do that, let's see. All 
All right, if you go to stat. That. Go to calculate. You go down and grab the lin, re, lin reg function. That's short for linear regression. Hit enter. X data is in list one. Y data is in list two. Uh, just go down to calculate. And we're ready. Just hit enter. And you can see R has been computed. It's 0.92737, blah, blah, blah. Uh, R squared is the squaring of R. That's called the coefficient of determination. Uh, we'll talk about what A and B are uh, next week when we get into linear regression, okay? But there's your correlation coefficient there, ladies and gentlemen. Obviously, the calculator computes a little bit faster than we can. Uh, but it's nice to have a manual versus an automated way of doing things. Uh, nothing wrong with that. It's good to see the underpinnings behind the scenes as to what's generating this number uh, so that we can appreciate it. Um, I mean, stop and think. If we never looked at the formulas as to where our numbers are coming from, then we would all become just button pushers in society. Do you agree? And being all button pushers in society, ladies and gentlemen, we would, we would not be able to extend or extrapolate a field into new ideas or uncharted waters. For that reason, it's important for somebody to know the theory behind the scenes, okay? Uh, it's these people that extrapolate the ideas and create new ideas and take a field in brand new directions, all right? If we're all button pushers, well, that's all we are is button pushers. All right, that's not going to help us to take a theoretical idea and expound upon it or develop from it or derive from it brand new ideas or brand new formulas or, or theories. Okay, so it's important to see the theory uh, behind the scenes, the formula behind the scenes. Um, that's like the analogy would be um, all of us probably know how to drive a vehicle. Um, as opposed to being an auto technician, a person that actually knows the underpinnings of what makes an automobile do what it does. There's a huge difference between the two, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, it's easy to get in and just turn a vehicle on and press on the gas pedal. But when it comes time to maybe changing out a bearing or uh, maybe changing out a clutch or something like that, that's where we fall short. Do you agree? So somebody's got to know the underpinnings and how things work. Same thing in math. Somebody's got to know the formula, all right? The theory behind the scenes, very important. Okay, so there we go. Uh, were you able to follow me with all that? Well, it's all being recorded here, so you can look at that uh, if you missed anything. Okay, now ladies, I want to show you this hypothesis test here, um, which is a um, further, uh, it further reinforces, okay, uh, our hunch, if you will, as to what type of correlation we have between X and Y. Uh, a value of R close to one or negative one suggests, of course, that we have a very strong linear relationship. Um, but this strong linear relationship could be due to change when there is no linear trend in the population. Uh, we can use a hypothesis test to make this decision as long as the data are quantitative, come from a random sample, a scatter plot shows a rough linear trend. There are no outliers and the variables X and Y both come from normally distributed populations. If in general, that's all true, those assumptions, we can then conduct the following hypothesis test. We can test the null hypothesis that says the population correlation, linear correlation coefficient is equal to zero versus the alternative statement that says, no, it is not equal to zero. Okay. And the bottom line is this. If sample evidence is strong enough to suggest that we can reject the null hypothesis and go with the alternative statement, then ladies and gentlemen, that's saying the population correlation coefficient is not equal to zero which means that there's probably strong evidence to suggest that there's some sort of a linear relationship between X and Y, whether it be a positive or a negative relationship. If on the other hand, 
sample evidence is not strong enough to enable us to reject the null hypothesis, then there might be strong cause to say that essentially there's poor or maybe no linear relationship between X and Y whatsoever. All right. And our test statistic here is distributed according to the student T distribution. And this is it. Uh, notice that we need to know the sample correlation coefficient R and also the coefficient of determination R squared along with the number of ordered pairs. We'll substitute things into here. And this is our test statistic value. Uh, the test is conducted with n minus two degrees of freedom. And the reason why it's n minus two degrees of freedom as opposed to n minus one degree of freedom is because with a you know, univariate data set, if you just have like one column of data, then we only have one degree of freedom. But if you have ordered pair data, then you got two different coordinates, X and Y. And that's why there's two less degrees of freedom as opposed to just uh, one column of data or a univariate data set. All right. Now, for example, the correlation coefficient for the heights of the buildings was uh, 0.927. Let's test the significance of this value at 5%. So in other words, we're going to test these hypotheses uh, at 5% uh, for the building heights versus stories of uh, stories in the building. Now, there's six data ordered pairs. Uh, there's four degrees of freedom. Six minus four, uh, six minus two, rather, is four degrees of freedom. You could either use your T table or you could use your inverse T function to find your critical T values. This is going to be a two tailed test. So there's going to be two critical T values. And here again, this would be a picture of the student T probability distribution. You got two critical T values here, one that is negative and one that is positive 2.776. These are gonna be the values that separate the uh, reject from the do not reject interval or region. Notice our test statistic. Um, you know, I find this weird here. Why do they see, say T is equal to 0.927? That was, that was R, do you agree? That was our correlation coefficient from our sample. Here they finally get it right. And T, your test statistic, is equal to, so th this is the correct there. Your test statistic is 4.943. And notice 4.943 falls very safely in the upper tail rejection region up here. So yes, ladies and gentlemen, it looks like we can reject the null hypothesis and therefore go with the alternative hypothesis as being true. And this hypothesis says that if you looked at, at the population of all the buildings, okay, there could be several thousands or millions of buildings, it looks like there is a linear relationship between the height of the building and the number of stories a building has. <clears throat> Why? because the population correlate, linear correlation coefficient is not equal to zero, which means that there is some sort of linear relationship that exists. So this hypothesis test is just, you know, strengthening our resolve in saying that, yeah, there is a correlation between the number of stories a building has and the height, okay? Um, so, you know, it, it, it at least is supporting what the scatter plot and the correlation coefficient have already told us. Any questions about conducting this uh, hypothesis test here? Let's see, that's, that's a t-test, right? No, I have a question. Let me think here. Could we conduct this t-test on our calculator? That's a good question. Let's see. Only one way to find out. Let's bring up our calculator and see if we can do this t-test. Uh, notice I still have my ordered pair data in the respective lists. Yeah, that's still for the, the building example there. Uh, if I go to stat tests and go down to the t-tests, uh,
And if we select data, let's see. Yeah, the problem here is it's only going to allow us to have one list of data for the t-test, not two. So it's not looking at this as being like ordered pair data here. Okay, hold on. That doesn't seem like it's going to work. Tell you what, let's go to stat, test. Let's keep scrolling down to see if there is a test out here. Oh, here's a linear regression t-test there, Lazama. I think that's it. The linear regression t-test, I think, will conduct this same hypothesis test here. Uh, yeah, let's, let's do that. Let's select, let's select the linear regression t-test. Notice the x data is in list one, y data is in list two. Uh, there you go. Uh, row is not equal to zero. That's what we want. Calculate. And notice we get our test statistic there, which is 4.9. Well, they got 4.957, pretty close to 4.943. That's not going to change our decision whatsoever, by the way. We have a very small p-value, which means we're able to reject the null hypothesis all the way down to 1% if we have to go that low with alpha. And so, again, this is a very conclusive test to say that row is not equal to zero. And there you go. Yeah. So you can conduct this test. It's called the Lin Reg T test function. Anybody see that there? Okay. So it does work. That's cool. Uh, so we can do it manually, or we can use the calculator to speed things up, um, especially if you're doing things on, uh, uh, you know, Alex, and you're pressed for time. Uh, very important here. All right. Um, so I'm just going to leave it at that. You can look at this slide here, but we're not going to do things this way. We already figured out how to do this test here, so we're good. All right. Correlation versus causation. Now, if the null hypothesis has been rejected when we conduct that hypothesis test, two slides back, one of the following five things could be true. The variable X could be a variable that causes the change in the variable Y, or the variable Y causes the change in the variable X. In this situation, there's a confusion between cause and effect. Another thing that could be uh, happening is the relationship between X and Y is caused by a third lurking variable that was not included in the study. <clears throat> or there could be a complex interrelationship between X and Y and many other variables that have not been accounted for in the study. Or the relationship is coincidental. In this case, we have made a type one error in saying that, um, you know, there's a significant relationship between X and Y. Now, this is something that's very important here. Does correlation always imply causation? And that's the, the thing here is, is the answer is no, it does not. Okay. No, it does not. We could have what's called a lurking variable. There's a, a lurking variable. Okay. For instance, let me give an example. Uh, suppose X represents the number of crimes that are committed in a big city. And suppose that Y represents the number of air conditioners that are turned on by people that live in the city. Well, in the summertime, ladies and gentlemen, when it gets hot and humid, uh, cities usually are called heat islands. They tend to retain a lot more heat, deliver a lot more heat after the sun sets. For that reason, okay, uh, air conditioners are, you know, um, usually going to be on more so in big cities than they would be out in the rural areas. And statistics show in general that crimes are more so committed in the warmer temperatures or the warmer seasons than they are in the colder seasons. 
So I have a question for you, ladies and gentlemen. If I was to collect an ordered pair data set with X being the number of crimes to say that were committed in a month in a big city and Y being the number of air conditioners that were turned on during the month for that same city, if I was to collect an ordered pair data set for many, many, many large cities around the country or the world, my correlation coefficient would show that there's a strong positive correlation between the number of crimes that are committed in the city versus the number of air conditioners that are on in the city. Strong positive correlation. In other words, in general, this correlation coefficient will show me that when crime rates increase, air conditioner rates increase and vice versa. I have a question for you. Just because these two variables are strongly correlated with one another, does it mean that they are cause and effect for one another? Does it mean that if a crime is committed, that will cause somebody to flip on their air conditioner? What do you think? Do you think strong correlation here implies causation? No. Nope, not at all. Even though these two variables are strongly correlated, they're not cause and effect for each other. Okay, just because somebody flips on the air conditioner doesn't mean somebody's gonna go downtown and rip off a store because of that. No, ladies and gentlemen, we have what's called a lurking variable in this situation, a variable that has not been taken into account. And that lurking variable is called the air temperature. Temperature, season, okay, has not been taken into account. In general, crime rates increase when the weather gets nicer outside. Well, it so happens that, well, when that happens, yeah, air conditioners tend to come on more frequently also. So you got to be very careful. Just because you have a strong correlation between two variables does not necessarily imply that you have strong causation between the variables. Listen, normally you do. Normally when two variables have a strong correlation with each other, normally there is a cause and effect between the variables, okay? But not always, not always. Okay, so just be careful. All right. Okay, well, let's go to our textbook here in the remaining time and see if we can uh, get into trouble here. Uh, we'll be hanging out in section 10.1. Trying to pay some bills today. All right, so 10.1 is entitled correlation, uh, let's see, uh, scatter plots and correlation. All right, let's go down and maybe look at a problem or two here. All right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, problem number 11 here. Uh, what I want you to do with this problem is um, a couple of things here. Number one, I want you to compute the correlation coefficient R. Please do so manually using the formula. And I'll put the formula up here in a moment. Uh, I also want you to build a scatter plot with this ordered pair data. And I want you to test these hypotheses. Now, you can test the hypotheses using your calculator. You do not have to you know, do it the uh, critical value way. Uh, you can just use your uh, Lin reg t test function um, to test these hypotheses here. Wait a minute, that's wrong.
Okay. All right, so I want you to compute the correlation coefficient R, conduct this hypothesis test by reporting the p-value and your decision, and also do a scatter plot with this ordered pair data set. Now, uh, what's considered to be the X data, what's considered to be the Y data? What would depend upon what here? Do you think the age of a person depends upon the number of accidents they have driving an automobile or the other way around? What do you think, ladies and gentlemen? What would be a natural choice for our dependent and independent variable here? A random selection of drivers, their ages, and the number of automobile accidents that they had over a three-year period are shown. What depends upon what do you think? It seems like a number of what accidents might depend upon the age of the driver. And insurance companies know that. Okay, so they do their work too, their homework. And that determines the different premiums we pay based on age. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there you go. I want you to do problem number 11 here, all right? Go ahead and do that. Compute R, conduct this hypothesis test, and do a scatter plot. All right, we'll call that classwork one. Now, uh, the scatter plot, uh, what you could do is you can sketch it on your paper, okay? You know, you got your X axis, you got your Y axis. It doesn't have to be 100% precise. Just kind of plot the points or sketch it. Uh, the way it looks on your calculator screen. Just kind of do the best you can, okay? All right.
All right. Um, this would be the scatter plot of the data set where the horizontal axis is the uh, age and the, um, the vertical axis is the um, number of accidents. You can see, ladies and gentlemen, that there's a fairly uh, strong linear inverse correlation between age versus number of accidents. Um, in general, as the age of the driver increases, the number of accidents tend to decrease. Um, that's something that we probably all known and um, I myself can attest to that uh, having experienced uh, crack ups when I was younger as opposed to now um, but um, this is not necessarily saying that all young drivers experience accidents some don't but in general uh, the more driving experience you have in general you tend to uh, refrain from having uh, incidents Okay. All right. Um, now, did anybody get a scatter plot that looks something like this? Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Does, it, does your scatter plot look like this? Anybody? Yep. All right. The next thing is I wanted you to uh, compute the uh, correlation coefficient, the linear correlation coefficient uh, manually. Um, and here is uh, how you'd want to do that manually. Of course, this table helps you to, you know, compute uh, values that you need for that complicated formula there. Um, I have a question. Did anybody do column mathematics on their calculator? In other words, enter in the X data in list one, Y data in list two, and just have your calculator square list one. Anybody do column math to speed this up just a tad? I did. Yeah. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Column math. I mean, it speeds this up uh, big time. Okay. And you can use the uh, one bar stats feature for each of these columns to get the sum of each column. If you don't want to manually add them all together, just go to one bar stats, select like list three, which will sum, and then look at the sum of X, which is really the sum of X squared in that case, which will give you the 9340. So your calculator can really help speed up, you know, the drudgery of even the manual way of doing this. And then uh, once you find all these quantities out, you can plug them into the uh, Pearson linear correlation coefficient formula. There's eight ordered pairs. I put all the values in where they belong according to the formula. That's the sum of your X, Y values. That's the sum of X times the sum of Y n times the sum of x squared minus the sum of x squared n times the sum of y squared minus the sum of y which is squared anyways you crank it out and you get about negative 0.923 anybody get that yep all right and that basically is in line with what we would expect after having seen the scatter plot that we have a very strong negative linear relationship between uh, the age of a driver versus the uh, number of uh, incidents or accidents that are experienced. Um, and that's comforting to know, ladies and gentlemen. So there's at least one good thing that happens to your life when you get older. Um, usually it's not health, but um, you tend to have less accidents behind the wheel. That's a good thing. Um, hopefully your health holds out too when you get older. Anyways, conducting the hypothesis test, the LINREG t-test for testing uh, the hypotheses that uh, the population correlation coefficient is equal or not equal to zero, I came up with a p-value, which is about a smidget larger than 1%, okay? And so notice we can reject the null hypothesis all the way down. Um, well, it has to be a little above 1% for alpha, maybe about 2% for alpha. So we'll reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the population correlation coefficient for all drivers, the whole population, which could be in the millions, 
is not equal to zero, which indicates that there is a correlation uh, between uh, driver experience and number of accidents. Okay, and this hypothesis test is reflecting that too. Okay. All right. Um, did anybody get that p-value? Yes. Okay. And so we um, uh, did a lot of work there if we did the problem manually. Uh, let's see if there's any other interesting problems in here. Let's see. Oh, students, what's going on here? 16 randomly students here, yeah. Okay, what I want you to do with this data set here, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is two things. I want you to use your calculator and build a scatter plot. Um, now, this data shows the final exam grades for 16 randomly selected students taking both college algebra and statistics. Uh, use the college algebra scores for the independent variable. Uh, this will be your X variable and the statistics scores for the dependent variable. I want you to make a scatter plot, and I want you to compute the correlation coefficient R. You do not have to compute the correlation coefficient R manually. Just use your lin reg, okay, your linear regression test to crank it out for you. All right, go ahead and do that. We'll call this class word number two. All right, so I want a scatter plot and just compute R um, using your calculator. Oh, while you're at it, why not just do the, the T test also, okay? All right, so do those three things. Scatter plot, compute R, t-test. Do it all using your calculator. Don't compute R manually. All right, go ahead.
Okay, this is the scatter plot I got. Um, I put the uh, college exam scores in list one. The statistics of uh, exam, uh, the statistics exam scores in list two. So my horizontal axis would represent the college el algebra exam scores. And the vertical y-axis would be the statistics uh, exam scores. Notice by the scatter plot, it does appear. First of all, did anybody get the scatter plot? Anybody's scatter plot look like this one? Yes. All right. So can anybody tell me um what the, what 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 information we can gather from the scatter plot? What does the scatter plot tell us? That is positive. Now, yeah, it looks like we have a, um, a fairly strong positive linear correlation between uh, the exam scores from the stats course and the college algebra course. So it looks like um, the score that you get on your college algebra exam uh, is uh, fairly strongly correlated with the score that you get on your stats exam. Okay. Um, let's go take a look at the correlation coefficient. Now, what would we suspect the correlation coefficient are to be equal to? Just by looking at this uh, scatter plot, what would be your guess? If you had to guess what R is equal to, what would you say? Anybody? Like about 9.9? About 0.9, somewhere in there. All right. Yeah, I'd probably be guessing around there, too. Certainly not negative, because this is a positive linear correlation. Let's go find R. To do that, we hit our stat button. Go over to calculate. Go down a linear regression. Make sure you're, that your stat diagnostic feature is turned on or else you will not see R reported. Hit enter. Hit enter. 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 Calculate. And there's R. Yeah, 0.914. So, I mean, I'm not surprised to see that. It's very close to positive one. We have a very strong positive linear correlation. Now, when we conduct that t-test, what would be your guess as to what the p-value for that t-test would be? Would it be a large or small p-value? What do you think? Small? Yep. Yeah. Which would lend ourselves, what, rejecting the null and going with the alternative statement that says the population uh, correlation coefficient for all students taking college algebra versus statistics and their exam scores are uh, positively score uh, correlated. So when we conduct this uh, linear regression t-test, we would just suspect that the p-value is going to be small, enabling us to reject the null hypothesis and saying that, yes, there is a correlation between these exam scores between these two different courses. So let's go down and conduct that two-tailed test. And we do get an extremely small p-value, seven times 10 to the negative seventh power. So we can definitely reject at all levels of significance. Heck, we could drive alpha all the way down to even um, <clears throat> maybe even something lower than what, 1%, correct? So there's there's no risk for, of committing a type one error here and rejecting that null hypothesis. So this is an extremely conclusive test. All right, so today we opened up the chapter 10 and began looking at correlation of ordered pair data. We've seen how to compute the correlation coefficient manually and using the calculator. Also how to make a scatter plot and what a scatter plot can tell us as to the relationship that exists between ordered pair data, okay? Next week, we'll show ourselves how to actually model the ordered pair data according to a linear equation. 
And then we can use that equation to make forecasts or predictions. All right. All right. That will be when we look at or investigate regression next week. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'll stay on the line for a couple of minutes if you have any questions or concerns. If not, have a great weekend. Hopefully, I'll see you tomorrow and we'll make our final push to the end of the semester. Hello, Stanley. Any other remaining questions or concerns? Sydney, I'm sorry about that. Okay. If not, you have.